Hi, my name is Reggie Williams. Hi, my name is Londe Yusuf. And we are the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we present our Writers on Writing panel discussion from the New Orleans Film Festival. We talk with television screenwriters Felicia Pride, who writes for Queen Sugar, and Roche Jeffrey, who writes for Smil. In this discussion, Felicia and Roche talk about their journey, screenwriting portfolios, getting an agent, their perspectives on the white gaze, and much more. Before we begin, please note that this recording is best listened to with headphones. And now, on to our interview. I'd like to introduce you to Lande Yusuf, who's the co-founder of Black Film Space. <laughs> Felicia Pride, film and TV writer. And Roche Jeffrey, film and TV writer and director. Hi guys. Hi. How y'all doing today? Good. How are you ladies doing? Wonderful, thank you. Good. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let's just start off with getting a poll of the audience. How many of y'all are writers? Everybody. Okay. And how many of you haven't written yet, but you're interested? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Just getting engaged as my who's interested in the area of writing, which is, again, everyone. Um, <laughs> so uh, why don't you guys talk, start off with uh, telling us about how you got into writing professionally, like your journey. Sure. Yeah. Um, I actually started, uh, I graduated from college with a degree in marketing and business, because I thought that sounded like I could get a job. And I was able to get a job in that. Um, then I found myself quickly bored. And so I started interning at a newspaper. So my start was really in journalism. I came from the world of journalism. I was an entertainment journalist who wrote a lot about music and culture. Um, and then I came hard for the oh. answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I have to check into my Southwest flight, so I'm like kind of looking at this. Um, one, one minute. Um, but uh, I got into the, it was through journalism, and then um, I always wanted to write books, so I actually went back to school. I went to Emerson. Uh, and study creative writing. Oh, okay. Did you want to have some writing? Yeah, did. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I got my master's um, in writing literature and publishing um, at Emerson. So my dream was to both write books but also run an independent publishing house until I found out how fucked up the business model is <laughs> of book publishing. So I kind of let go of that dream. But I did originally move to New York and I worked in book publishing from a marketing perspective and I was writing on the side continuously to write. And then I was able to land a literary agent and I wrote books. So I wrote about six books, and then I stopped writing for about seven years, and in that time I ran a consultancy where I was, at the time, which is now called or considered an impact producer, that's yes. what I did. I helped social justice media reach different audiences. And that was lovely, important work, but I just felt the calling to get back to my creator roots. Um, so about four and a half years ago, I moved to LA to uh, focus on writing for t TV and film, and I went out there with one feature that I was blessed enough to sell a feature that has been um, produced by Macro called Ooh. Really Love. It stars Kofi Zerbo, who yes. actually lives in New Orleans. Um, and I also then was in the Film Independent Screenwriting Lab. I did the NBC Writers on the Verge as a comedy writer. I sold a drama pilot to Universal Cable Productions. I am a writer on Queen Sugar, and I most recently sold a feature to Universal with Will Packer Productions producing. So basically, you're <laughs> It's time Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it happened all in two years, like you did all that. <laughs> okay, so it's your turn, Roche. Tell us how you got into the business. Um, well, I think for me, my journey was a long, kind of circuitous uh, path. Essentially, um, I was a poli sci English double major at Howard University. And bison. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and at the end of my junior year, I switched my major to film. Uh, which was crazy. And I ended up having to take a bunch of classes uh, 
summer school. I took TED classes my last semester of college to graduate on time because I'm an immigrant. And my parents were, Jamaica. Yeah, I'm Jamaican. <laughs> and my parents were not about the graduating late life. Um, <laughs> so they were like, if you're going to do this crazy psychotic thing, you still have to graduate on time. Um, and so I did. And I went to Belize. I directed a television show there called No Matter What, which um, people who are from Belize know. If you're not from Belize, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And um, I then got scared. And so I actually went back to DC. I worked in the nonprofit sector. I worked in communications for a number of years. And I actually, although there are a lot of Howard grads in LA who are in the business, I did not know them because I was a film major so late in my career. So I was doing other things for a long time. And it wasn't until about five years ago when I read The Alchemist. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, I am, my life is terrible. Um, <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? Um, I'm living in this basement. I hate my job. Um, and, I re and I started watching Breaking Bad. And I was like, oh, this is so good. So the combination of Breaking Bad and The Alchemist got me back <laughs> on a path to creativity and writing for television. And I wanted to work in features. But I quickly kind of studied the landscape of the entertainment industry, and I recognized that there were more jobs in film, I mean, in TV. And so I started to write, teach myself how to write a pilot. I wrote that pilot. I sent it to somebody in LA who did notes. And I don't know who this man was. Um, but I was like, when you don't know anything about the business, you're like, he sounds important. Um, he gave me feedback. I was like, oh, this is not trash. And I was like, great. Um, I packed up my stuff and I moved to LA. You were in DC at this point. I was still in DC. Okay. Um, but off the strength of the, you know a couple of people who supposedly knew what they were talking about telling me that I wasn't garbage, I was like, this is great. I'm going to change my whole life. Um, and so I moved to LA. And since then, I was a project involved fellow for Film Independent. Um, I wrote a short that has been at 25 festivals and it's now on HBO. I've written on seven seasons of television on five different shows. Um, and now I'm a producer on a show called Woke, which will be on Hulu next year, which stars Lamar uh, Morris from New Girl. Um, I'm in the Viacom's director's program. Um, and yeah, I've done a really, a lot, a lot of awesome, fun, great things in the entertainment industry. So Felicia, you took a break. What motivated you to, well, what, how did you end up taking a break? And you, you talked about like being called to write again. How, how did it feel to like get back in from taking such a long pause? Mm, um, I took a break because I, I began to have like a fucked up relationship with the work in, in the sense that I was really dependent on writing to financially sustain me and I realized that that's not the goal of writing. And so I got scared because I was not able to make money from writing, so I made the fatal mistake of stopping to write. There's nothing wrong with getting a job. I had to get a job, but I should have got a job and continued to write, but instead I stopped to write. And then I started my own business and got caught up in that, and that was really difficult. So the, the sort of crossroads for me was when I was running my business, I got a really huge contract doing some shit that honestly I wasn't really that great at, but I was a big check. And then the check, they told me they were shutting down the project, so the check went away. And I just came to a point where I was like, I'm tired of chasing checks. I'm creatively bored. I want to be back um, doing writing. And my mentor at the time was like, you should move to the biggest market. You should move to LA. You don't have much to lose. You can always come back. And that was a defining point for me. But it's funny because moving to LA did not solve the problem of my relationship with the work. I had to do a lot of self work. And it was like clearly kind of like a war with myself mm -hmm. to get back to writing and help. I almost had to court it again. You know what I mean? Like I had to wow. like take it on dates and be like, hey, bro. Like I really had to um, prioritize it in a way that I hadn't done in several years while also you know, paying bills. And so at that point, I, I, when I first moved to LA, I was working in film distribution, I got laid off. When I got laid off, I was like, okay, this is a sign, I came to LA to write. Let me prioritize writing. So I took a lot of odd jobs. I was like a virtual assistant for this nonprofit. I was very overqualified for the position, still not good at it, but it allowed me to write. And that was like the, that was the thing when I changed my perspective about the role of writing in my life. That's when things started to open up, and I really prioritized it, and I really started to put in the work to professionalize it, to get my sam my samples together, to get my portfolio up, to sell this film. Um, so yeah, but it was a war. It was it was probably one of the most I call it my creative comeback. It was one of the most difficult things I've had to do 
to get back to a creative space. And now I'm in a creative zone and I'm fucking unstoppable. Yes. I took everything to get back here. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a common thing with writers. Do you ever feel those blocks, Roche? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the time. I'm, you know, I think all writers, uh, my mentor, for instance, gets up every day at 6 a.m. and writes no matter what. For how long? For until she goes to work on a show that she's an executive producer for. Yes. I do not know what that means. Like, I'm like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Um, I literally write when I feel like it, but I'm always writing, right? Like, the, the act of sitting down and actually writing is very different from the, the process, which I think for me is always happening and I'm always kind of thinking about material, but there are definitely times where that act of sitting down and actually putting, you know, interior or exterior, it's really difficult for me. Um, and I'm very emotional. I'm a Leo. Um, and I'm, yeah, you know, I'm a West Indian. So there's a lot of like, I, I, I'm, I'm not that person who could just write no matter what. Um, and it just takes a lot of, Sometimes I talk to Felicia. <laughs> you We're know. in a group together. Yeah, awesome. and you know it takes a lot of work to try to get through those uh, those blocks. Yeah. So how is it integrated into your routine? Do you write every day? Do you write like? Well, I, you said you write when you feel like it. So how, how often do you? Write? I typically write every day. Um, I for me the urgency is there are a number of projects that I need to tell before this life is over. Um, and then also that urgency is now connected to checks. Because the lovely thing is like when you let go of writing <laughs> needing to pay you, it starts to pay you. So then it's like, oh, I have these two urgencies. And so for me, there are just so many stories that I want to tell. And I have a system of how I move projects through that I, I typically work. And I was kind of telling her, even if it's just 25 minutes a day, you'd be surprised. You can write a good two to three pages a day in a feature that you can get it done in three months. You know what I mean? So um, I try to just at least put pen to paper. Monday through Friday. Yeah, I write when there's a check. Um, and <laughs> I'm very on point when that money, I'm like, ooh, that check is coming, ooh. Um, I can write when there's a check, for sure. Um, but like, just in my free time, I, it's, it's tough and I really have to kind of set, I think sometimes it's important for you when there isn't that incentive of financial incentives to say, okay, you know what, I'm applying to this thing by this date, or, and that's why writers groups are important, or having people who are accountability partners to say, I'm getting this done by November 1st, no matter what. Um, you have to create your own deadlines if you're someone like me who lacks discipline. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. That's very reassuring, because I kind of ebb and flow between the two of you, mm -hmm. so thanks. <laughs> um, can you talk about the first time you got into a writer's room for a show and like how you were feeling and how you just kind of, you know, faked it till you made it in the room, so to speak. Like map that out for us. Yeah, the first time, I think it, one of the things that I think is interesting about, I think both of us actually, is that we did a lot of research about the industry, I think before we entered the writer's room. So for me, I went at, in pretty empowered. Like I had gone to a bunch of panels in LA, I'd write about a, you know, a lot of articles and blogs. And so I went into the room with a certain expectation that I was a staff writer. And if you don't know, like in, in writer's rooms, there is a hierarchy and it's literally your title. So it's staff writer, um, it is a story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-executive producer, and EP, which is usually the store of the showrunner, right? So there is a hierarchy in the room based on experience and sometimes not, but that's another story for the day. Um, and so when you're in the, the room, there's a sense, at first I was like, am I gonna be allowed to speak? Like, will they be interested in anything I have to say? And every room is different. And I was lucky enough that my first experience was great. And they actually, um, and this is the truth, the show had a lot of black characters and we were black. Uh, my former writing partner and I were black. So they were like, so what, what happens next? Like, so there was a lot of, they were like deferring to us a lot. And we were very much a part of the crafting of the, the, the show and the narrative. So it was an empowering experience. Um, but it was also like, wow, this dream came true. But the thing about my journey, and I, I don't know if it's unique to me, is that every time like I unlock one goal, I'm like, this is cool, but okay, next. Like, and that was kind of, how I felt like it was like this is great but there's there's more to come okay. awesome. yeah I mean well God knows my heart so he was able to put me in a room where I, cause I moved to LA at 35 so I was in the room at 39 mm -hmm. and I was a staff writer which 
can some people think is old, but for me, it, it was for Queen Sugar, and um, it was we had a black male showrunner who is so sensitive, so smart, so passionate, a fucking beast on the page, but also who wanted everyone to bring their full selves into the room. And I never had a professional experience in my life where I could bring like Baltimore, New Jersey, quirky, black chick, mm. like all in the room at once. Yeah. And so it was a really, really great experience for me because you hear shit shows of like where the hierarchy really plays out, where they don't want you to talk. I remember even the producer was like, you talked in the first 30 minutes of the room. <laughs> and I was like, because I had something to say. Like, then that's how I am. So I found a room, luckily, that did not shut that, that down, down. Yeah. that embraced that. Um, and it was just a fantastic experience. And I also think that it's two things that I learned the first time around is number one is that um, you gotta write fast. <laughs> like, I think sometimes we take two years to write our pilots. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got two weeks, if that. So I think that for writers out there, if you can get into the mode of writing faster, that will serve you well in the writer's room. And then number two, what I learned is that you never really learn long form storytelling until you're in the room because we are mainly writing pilots, right? So you never really like, oh, tracking the emotional journey from four, episode 401 to episode 412, from episode 301. So for, it's such a wonderful learning experience to really, really be able to dive into full on long form storytelling. Yeah, and you're constantly learning. I think that's the the thing that's amazing about the experience is this is what I think it's either my fifth or sixth room and every day I'm like, wow, this is new information. I didn't know anything about this kind of character development or comedy because I wrote write both comedy and drama and so you know I'm constantly learning. Um can you, so when you are in the writer's room, are you guys just talking for a while and then you eventually start writing? And does, it, and does that uh, work go up the chain? How does that process work? I mean, it definitely varies by room for room, but our room is very much like that, where we break everything down. You know, of course, of course, of course, of course the season um, and thinking about where we want this, the character arcs to go, but then we break every episode down. So everyone in the knows what's gonna happen in the episode. And then the writer who's assigned the episode goes off and writes outline, comes back, gets feedback, goes off and writes script. But we pretty much beat it out. Or I hear other rooms may give you a few bullet points for an episode and like, good luck, you know, but we really, really beat it out. Every room is different. Um, traditionally, I think, that what you just described is I think a lot of rooms, but there are some rooms, especially shows that have been around for a while. Like one of the writers on the show that I'm on now is, was on The Simpsons for 27 years. Um, they don't do any of that. They, at this point, they're just like, so this is what happens, he does something crazy. All right, go write it. And then they go off and they write it. Like, um, And there are rooms I've heard where people meet for four weeks and then everybody goes off for the rest of the time and they write their episodes. Um, I've been in rooms where we've group written episodes. So, but it you know, sounds crazy. Like, you said you like that though. I actually love group writing um, because it depends on the, the people you're with. If there are horrible people that you're working with, it's a horrible experience. But <laughs> if you're working with like nice people who are funny or interesting or know what they're doing, it can be great. It just expedites the process. Um, but yeah, there's group writing. So sometimes you'll outline a sh an episode and then we'll have a, the writer's assistant put it up on a TV and it's interior and then we're all coming up with the action and then the dialogue but that's rare and that's more of a comedy thing because comedy has a certain pace and comedy and drama rooms operate a little bit differently um so yeah it's it's all really kind of dependent on your showrunner what they like what the culture is and the demands like are you doing a network show with 22 episodes and you're behind schedule you know or are you doing a, sh a cable show with eight episodes and they gave you a whole 20 week contract to figure it out um, so it's all kind of different. Um, can you also talk about how you got the jobs? Did you have to send them like a, a spec script? Um, did you pitch ideas to the showrunner? How did you get connected to actually being hired? My journey was um, interesting. I mean, because it's a hard question to answer because there's not really like a succinct like, and then on January 25th, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was more like I wrote I wrote a pilot that um, that Issa Rae ended up optioning. That money allowed me to stay in LA. It then also gave me a little bit of cachet. A little heat. A little heat. <laughs> 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 it's hurt. Yeah. Uh, but that's what happens. It's like you're, there's there are a lot of 
opportunities in TV, but that's also a lie, right? Because it's like, <laughs> yeah, there are thousands of opportunities, but there are 10 times as many writers. So you have to kind of create your own heat. And um, most writers have agents or managers before we had to leave our agents behind. But at the time, you had agents and managers. And so that's how most people get their jobs is by their representatives or through working their way up through the system, which is actually a lot of what we do. It's like working our way through a writer's assistant, da 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 da. Or a friend, you know, it's like, hey, I have a friend who would be great for this. It's recommendations. For me, it was, I had a little bit of heat and then I did a contest. Um, which I recommend people do. Like I think that contests can sometimes be a crapshoot. Some, yeah, some crapshoot. And so it can be a waste of time. But there are some contests that are actually very valuable. And this, it wasn't even a contest. It was a list. It's called We for She, and it's an annual. Which is actually accepting nominations right now. Yes. Thank you. So We for She was something I'd never heard of before, and it wasn't like a NBC fellowship or Fox or Disney. But it was like a friend of mine was like, hey you should apply to this thing. And I was like, okay. And I applied to it, I got on the list, and my script ended up being an honorable mention and it got in all the entertainment trades, so like Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, et cetera. And, my, um, and these two white ladies, and I say it this way because I'm at this party <laughs> celebrating getting on this list, and these two older white ladies come up and they're like, we like you and we want to meet with you. And I was like, okay. Um, I just didn't know what they were talking about. They were like, we have a show and, and we are looking for writers. And in LA, that happens a lot. Like people are always talking and you're just like, whatever. So anyway, two weeks later, they, um, they read a script that my writing partner and I had written and they offered, to, they asked us to come in and interview. And it was just like, what? And even every, at every stage, I was like, this is a lie. Like, they're going to sell us a timeshare. Like, I don't know. Who <laughs> this whole time, I'm like, what's going on? Like, at every step, I was like. And they were like, no, we want. And really what it was is, back to what I was saying earlier, is like, we were these two black women. And this was a show that had a lot of black characters. And these were two white, older women. And they were like, we need some black people to help shape the show, which I appreciated. Um, and that's what kind of opened the door for us is the right time, right place. Right. And also just being open to possibility mm -hmm. and being willing to apply to something that we had no history with or under, like understanding of what they could do for us. So that's how I got my first uh, staffing job. Um, it's interesting because I've known Ava DuVernay for quite some time when she was, uh, I first met Ava at a festival called Black Lily back in uh, Philly. I don't know if anybody knows. Yeah, somebody in here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was like a black female music and film festival, and, she, and Ava was touring with her hip hop doc called This Is a Life. And I was hawking copies of my book called The Message, which was about hip hop. We connected there. This was before she did I Will Follow. And we were in touch. I've known her for a long time, worked on, I did the production of I Will Follow. She's a client, right? Yeah, I yeah. worked on Middle Nowhere as an impact producer. Um, but the thing is, it's like people, sometimes people know you for what you're doing, right? So even when I had to move out to LA, I had to remind people that I was a writer, that I started out writing first. I also think that, you know, people appreciate when you put in the work. Um, so when uh, it was like around town, like Queen Sugar was looking for writers, my agent at the time put me up for it. I did not ask Ava, and I was like, that's not what you do, you know what I mean? But um, I able, was able to actually get a meeting off of um, my spec script, so I kind of went the traditional process. My agent submitted me, the showrunner read me, liked it, brought me in, and when I came in, he had no idea I knew Ava, he no, had no idea that Kofi was starring in my movie. He and I just had a creative connection, and it worked out that way, and he was like, you need to tell your reps that like you were in here on the strength of your writing, which was actually a really great thing for me, and then also I think just a great thing for, um, you know, Ava likes people who work for there, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. I, I kind of went the traditional route with my staff. And of course, I think it's a, a whole, like, other things have to be in effect. Like, then I had people call the showrunner and recommend me on my behalf, and then, you know, programs, all these things help you. But um, at the end of the day, it was very traditional for me of submissions and getting a meeting and doing well in the room in the meeting. And then, yeah. Um, to piggyback off your comment about um, TV being obviously a more viable option for steady work, um, can you talk about the platforms that tend to be more responsive 
when you're, you know, reaching out for jobs, like is it streaming versus TV versus premium cable? Like, what do you tend to focus your efforts? Well, network has a, only so many jobs, right? right? So um, the network model, it's almost like, and this is ever evolving, but I think that you kind of pick a path. And I think some people are like, they're gonna do cable because cable hires throughout the year and it's shorter contracts and which comes with its drawbacks, right? It's usually less money. It's less money. Network money. But network money is unreal. <laughs> like network money, like if you're on a like procedural like um like NCIS or something, like the people who do law and order are still. I mean, there are people who say that uh, like a CSI script at like its height was worth like five hundred thousand dollars. When you think about residuals, because they run that shit over yes. and over. Wow. One script, and they do what yes. twenty two episodes. Of? Correct. So like people who are doing procedurals for networks are millionaires. Find you one of them. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> they make a lot of money, and it's but it's also like a lot of work. It's it's a forty because twenty two episodes. That's a very cut. It's 40 plus weeks out of your year of like, and then she, her dead body is found here. And then you have to like try to find like, plot, you know, that's a lot of soul draining work. I prefer to operate in the cable space, which is a little bit more inconsistent. And you have to staff say, for instance, twice that year to make what somebody in network is doing with one job. Right. So it's, so to me, it's not necessarily about like, uh, where it's easier or like what it's it's about like what kind of career do you want do you want to be doing you know NBC ABC broadcast shows that's a different kind of career and those are different specs that you're writing different scripts you're writing and samples to get in that world and a different trajectory if you're doing cable it's shorter contracts but you can move up faster you know because you don't have to spend 44 weeks as a staff writer you could spend 20 weeks as a staff writer and then on your next show you know, you're a story editor and you keep, keep moving up. Um, but I think for me, cable just staffs throughout the year and that's why I tend to stay in that space. Um, can you talk about an occasion where you've had to fight for an idea? Grace, <laughs> 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 Um, You know, uh, I think that, I think that one thing that I have realized is that at the end of the day, and we've had this conversation, it's not your show. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like you you kind of, and also it depends on what level you are, right? Luckily I'm in a room where um, my voice is respected and heard and elevated. Um, but if you're a staff writer, you, don't, you probably don't want to do too much fighting. It depends what level you are. But then even if you come to a certain level, I think you come to a, a, a point in your, in your realization of like, this is not my show. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when it is your show, I'm sure you you want to make those battles, and those battles won't be in the room. Those will be with executives. Those will be with uh, cast, but they won't be in the room. You'll make those battles. But I think you just come to the point where you say what you have to say. You say your piece. You know, you represent for all black people or all black women or whatever the case is, and then you say this is not my show because at the end of the day, it's not. Like I think that's the thing that we have to remember. Yes, it's creative work, but it's also a job. You are in service of your showrunner and your show creator. Yeah, if you're a staff writer on somebody else's show, you are going to work every day, right? And so a lot of the politics that you experience in a corporate job is the same politics, if not worse. Um, and so you have to understand very early, which has been a journey for me, like, I'm, I say that thing is racist once, and then I, I go and get a snack. I, I, I don't have time to go back and forth about anything, because one, it's not gonna make a difference, and two, like, you have to know your position. I said it, I did my job, I lobbied for it, I may go back one more time and say it, but then at the end of the day, it's not your show. Um, and they're gonna have to deal with the tweets, you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, that's the only way to survive. But I think that's why it's also important and why, you know, it's important for us, our trajectory, yes, we are staffing, but, you know, ultimately is to have those in the air so that we can have that um, carte blanche of being able to override decisions and present things how we want to present. And that's why it's important to have, you know, certain people as showrunners and also certain people as, certain people as show creators. So you embrace playing the role of, like, a black 
female because you know some people say oh well i want to i want to be a writer that can write anything so well, yeah, <laughs> what, what's your position on that? I, wants that. I don't I, first of all i don't i have no i don't need to write white people's stories like i feel like there's enough white people writing white people's stories okay. now if you know chicago fire wants to holler at me <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean but I, in terms of the stories that that's the thing it's the thing so we have to take jobs in order to sustain our careers, right? But that's not necessarily the long vision. The long vision is multiple shows on the air. The long vision is like, you know, a production company that is allowing me to green light projects. I could just walk in a room and green light other people's projects. Like the, you have to have a perspective of the short term and the, and the long term. And the short term for me is like, I don't need to write everything. I, I am open to jobs where I have to write up with other people's voices. I do think that I can do it because I've been around white people and I've had to study them and observe them and understand them much more than they have to have had to understand me. But that's not my thing. When I write shit for, for me and for what I want to do, it is not... And I have no problem being a black female writer because that's what the fuck I am. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need to, like, just call me right. Like, that's... Everybody has their own thing, but that's not mine. And it's also the fastest way to not be impactful or have a career. Because the reality is, if your manager or agent is pitching you for a job, right, and it's a job about uh, something that you may not even think directly you have a relationship with. It could be about like a bunch, I'm black Jamaican. It could be a bunch of like Mexican girls who are skateboarders, right? And their, their pitches, oh, she's she can write everyone. like. That's not interesting. But if you could, they could say, this is someone who really captures the experience of an immigrant and her work. And they can speak to specific things that you talk about that are rooted in your biography. It makes it, it's, a, it's easier for people to sell you. And I think a lot of times as people of color, we tend to think like, oh, let's make, you know, let's fall in line with everyone else. Well, everyone else is doing everyone else. So like, if you can write your specific narrative so well, um, that it translates to other people, like that's your job. Like that's a great thing to be able to do and it's gonna, you're gonna be able to sustain a career that way because you write with specificity and you write about something that no one else is writing about but it still translates to other people. And I, I when I started, I was writing about white men because that's literally, I was 20 and I didn't know any better. And I was like, well, I wanna get things made. And then I was like, that's stupid. And the, the most success I ever had as a writer was when I wrote something that was super specific to my experience. And that's when things started to take off. I feel like that's a lot of our friends have had a similar journey where like, you find success in the specificity. Once we become specific, um, that's when shit starts to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to piggyback off of that, how do you, cause you know, they always say write what you know, right? Which is essentially what I was insinuating. How do you establish the boundaries with, with uh, not telling too much of your personal business and still being able to write something that reflects your personal journeys? I never worry about that. Mm. I have a pilot for a show that I want to star in that is obscenely, it's like it's so close to me that it's disturbing. But at the same time, I'm like, that's what makes it special. Um, and I think, I hope that people are sophisticated enough too that they can recognize that you could write something that's super specific and it doesn't necessarily have to be you, right? Um, and I think that uh, there's power in that. I think those are the stories. When you look at, like, you go to festivals and the first-time filmmakers or feature filmmakers, a lot of those stories are rooted in their biography. And those are the films that take off um, and do really well. Um, and it's because it's so specific and personal. So I, I, I don't think that there's... Um, I don't ever hold back. I just tell the story. Do you ever worry about like your family being like, why'd you put that me in there? I'm Jamaican. Um, <laughs> so my family will disown me and I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, that, I just, I, I had to give that away a long time ago. Awesome. I don't know. I'm working on an indie feature right now that I hope to direct that is inspired by my mother, my sister, and my niece. And I just think I'm a little nervous because, yeah. um, and, and you know, it's also, you know, the favorite word, the buzz, the buzzwords, these days with wish fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Studio, they go in a studio like, oh, this feature stuff. But it was, it, for me, this indie is kind of wish fulfillment for them. And I don't know how they're going to feel about that. Wait, um, what's that? What's that? What's that? <laughs> like, it's kind of, wish fulfillment <laughs> is like, 
you know, projects that are uh, aspirational, basically. Okay. Um, so it. for me, this is an aspirational feature for my family. I don't know how they're going to feel about that, but um, it is rooted in love. So I'm trying to decide, like, when I'm going to have to read it and that sort of thing. So I am a little nervous about that because it is close to home, but I also think that um, it's just a powerful story that needs to be told. So I'll find a way. Like, I wrote a, uh, my book about hip-hop was actually a collection of essays that were personal essays, and I did write about my family in different ways, and, you know, my mama still talks to me, so. Yeah, I mean, not to say, I, I don't want to be dismissive in saying that there's not ever a concern. Like, it's something I do think about, and I process, and I go to therapy about, but at the same time, I'm like, but this is my, my art is me, so I have to be able to make that separation. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, we could go into questions. Before, actually, before we go into questions, I wanted to ask you guys, what are the... You were talking about the term wish fulfillment. Are there any other, like, buzzwords that you always hear about when you're, like, out pitching or trying to get your work? Because, you know, in the industry, things operate in waves, right? This is hot, then it goes down, and, you know. There are so many, many buzzwords. Wish fulfillment is such a big one right now. Uh, aspirational diversity <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah aspirational is big in pitches you know um, a lot of films that's kind of how you can sell it it's like oh this is aspirational and people will want to be this stripper who you know <laughs> that's a big one <laughs> okay um, I guess we can go into questions for now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. We got somebody in the back. Hi. 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 Hello. So my first question is, um, as a writer, I feel like sometimes I write a lot of pain. So like I have trauma, struggle, bad experience with like rape or assault, which have happened to me in the past. A lot of joy, I really write of like positive things of joy. <clears throat> Do you feel like that that dichotomy you experience? in your career where some writers choose a bad experience is super inspirational, super robust in writing, but a good experience, like joy, you find less inspiration. Do you have that dichotomy or that silo, or how do you work with those two things? Yeah, I don't believe in the word positive or good. I am very interested in humanity, <laughs> and humanity can be messy. Um, and I think humanity does run the spectrum of both, both pain and joy. So I find that in my work, I, I combine those. I, I, my work is very dichotomous. Like that is actually the word that I use is dichotomy. I, I think the human experience is both joy and pain. And my work reflects that. I think that the challenge is, is that some people want black folks to always be good right. and positive, and I don't believe in that. I think it strips us of our humanity. Right. Um, so, and I, I lean towards messy. <coughs> That's who people I hail from messy people. I'm a complex individual myself, so those are the types of people that I want to see on screen. Um, but I think that you have to write what, what feels true to you. I think you have to write what feels authentic and not, sometimes I think we have to not be concerned about what other people will think, what the marketplace will think. I think what the marketplace ultimately, even though they act like they don't, ultimately they do, uh, are attracted to authenticity. Yeah, I, I have a real, this is a real thing for me that I go back and forth about because I think you can't tell, especially as a black person, you can't talk about or examine our experiences without pain. Like, that's impossible. But I also feel like a lot of our work is rooted in pain. And I'll even say sometimes, like, even some of my work. And um, and it's a difficult thing because at some point, you want to find that balance. And I also wonder, too, about the industry and their fascination with our pain as well. Because those are the things that are the easiest to green light. Um, you know, it's like there, she was a slave that right, wanted right. to play in the NBA, but her mom was on crack or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Those are the easiest things to get greenlit. And, you know, I recently co-wrote this film that's set in Liberty City, Miami, and it is the hood, but we wanted to make it as hopeful as possible because it's always so bleak and tragic. And, um, you know, I, so I try to find that balance as well. And I think it is important to show, because even in the darkest things, right, there's joy, there's laugh, 
there's laughter, there's happiness. So I think that's really important. I want to see more of that with people of color is being able to live in joy yeah. and, and yeah. you know, just examine that as well. Like, what does that look like? Let's, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's see that. Yeah, I think sometimes we make stuff that contrasts like the white experience and it always has to be like, oh, well, we've been oppressed and, you know, that's that defines the totality of who we are, but that's not necessarily yeah, true. Yeah, I think you know? that sometimes the pain stories are for white people. Like, we tell it to appeal to a white gaze yeah, and that's yeah. why they are so easily greenlit. I think there are pain stories. I'm interested in pain stories. Like, what does that look like with a black lens and a black, la- black gaze mm-hmm. and that is rooted in complexity and humanity because I always think that for the most point, for the most part, that joy is almost ever present. Um, and I think that black joy is resist is resistance. Um, so I'm interested. Were you ever tempted to write about black pain and exchange for white dollars? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't write for white people. That's one thing I'm very clear on, um, is that I'm not interested in the white gaze. I'm not interested in making white people feel comfortable. I'm not interested in, now white people do fund a lot of stuff, um, but I think the intention, (laughs) I I think the intention is important, right? The intention and then including, if you're a part of the the making of it, the the lens is important, right? The lens and the gaze. but I, I, I don't feel that pull of like, ooh, I need these dollars, let me make him a little bit more Donald Trump. Right. Like, I don't, I don't feel that pull at all. And I, I will also say that I, I think for me, I went on a journey where I was saying yes to a lot of things, and now I say no all the time. And I say it with my chest, and I'm excited about it, and I keep it moving. <laughs> because I don't care. Like, I don't do this for anybody but me. I make a good living, and I'm excited about it. But if I had to do something else to make a living, I would do it. Um, and so for me, my values aren't in necessarily like, oh, this is makes me a lot of money, so I have to like tap dance for people. I have established myself enough where I can feel comfortable saying no. So I don't write anything for but for me, to be honest. I write things that I want to see and that I'm interested in. And if other people want to watch it, cool. Like, I, I just, I don't, this career or this art is not going to kill me. I refuse to let it dictate how I live my yeah, life. Yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. I think that creating for the white dollar is not sustainable um, from a spiritual standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I have found in this business, you got to be connected to something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because the shit will yes. kind of make you nutty. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, there's, I find that I have a connection between craft and self work that's important to help me stay grounded. And I just don't think that's sustainable spiritually. I mean, do people try to get you to bear on that? Oh I'm my sure. God, yeah, they yeah. dangle money, they dangle, <laughs> you know, yeah. success. You, you see, you see, black artists who are doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, Right here, right here. Yeah. Um, how do you get an agent or manager without knowing anybody? And uh, how Make do you sure kinda, you guys speak up so we Yeah, how do you get an agent or manager without uh, knowing anyone? And then how do you kind of weed out the sketchy ones? Well, I would, I would not assume you don't know anyone. Because that's the thing. Like, I got my agent. So the, we, the way that I got my agent is I met my this homegirl, Zelly, from D.C. She was in LA. In LA and uh, we just hung out. She was cool. I, like... I liked her, and then she sent me an email. It was like, oh, I met this woman. You should meet her. I think you guys would hit it off. And I kind of dragged my feet a little bit, but I ended up meeting with this woman. Her name is Janelle. Janelle has worked in the industry, but has been out of the industry for a while. But Janelle happened to know an agent who was looking for stuff. And Janelle was like, I'll send your stuff to, no one does that, first of all. <laughs> she never read me. She was like, I'll send your stuff to him. Um, and she did that, which was big. And I had a general on that. So. Every you don't don't assume you don't know people who don't know people. You know what I mean. I will say though, for me, I've got both my agent. I got my manager from Joseph. Shout out to my brother Joseph. Um, it's been through referrals, and it's through been through black people. You know what I mean, or writers helping other writers. 
um, I think is really important. I think that the strongest aspect of anyone's network, any writer's network, is other writers. Because writers hire writers, writers recommend writers, writers refer writers. So what I would say is that if you feel like you don't know anybody, you need to get your network up. You know what I mean? And like really start to, and you can do it ways through social, and one way that I do it a lot is through volunteering, whether it's at film festivals, because it's a different pathway in. I did a lot of volunteering when I moved to LA, and one of my big focus, because I didn't know anybody, I knew Joseph, that was it. But I really worked hard to build my network out there when I was out there, um, and mine came through referrals. Tyler, can you get through? Oh, oh, yeah, I, my agent came through everything, actually. My first agent and my first manager, or my still my, my <coughs> manager, came through that contest. I was talking about that list. Um, it was- Which is accepting nominations now. Yeah, yeah. just accepting nominations now. But yeah, uh, my manager reached out because the list was circulated throughout the industry. My agent uh, reached out and that's how it happened. But most of what she's, that's not, that's very rare. 99% of representation comes through like a friend who is respected sends it to their agent says, hey, I have a friend who should be read. I personally think before you approach a representative, tangibly, you need at least two scripts, I think. Two uh, features, two, two I, if, if you're a feature writer, you need yeah. at least two features. I think you can do one. People get repped off of one. Mm -hmm. But I think that two is a strong number. Because a lot of times they'll read one and then say, what else do you have? Yeah. So you want to have at least two. I say, I tell people, go in when you have a portfolio. Like, yeah, yeah. I would say one feature. If you want to do feature in TV, one feature, two T, or two original TV pilots, one spec, and one play, short story, something other. Like actually, you know what my manager just sent uh, as a sample is my one of my novels. Ooh, I said right. okay, send it. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like one feature, two original pilots, one spec, and then one something other in the creative writing. Yes. Yeah. And honestly, for Joseph, like I've known Joseph forever. I didn't approach him to ask him to send my shit to his manager until I was ready. So don't go to your friends just because you're friends and not be ready. Like your shit is tight, you are ready. Because it's also their reputation yes. on the line when they are recommending you. So you wanna make sure that you are making them look good. Cause it does help them look good. Like, oh, thank you for referring me to this superstar. Yeah, I, I, I say that like, the more you have, the better. And it's not just about getting that rep. It's also about like, once you get that rep, being able to get work because if you have four scripts that all are a little slightly different and, and show your voice and demonstrate your skill then you can go for a whole like number of jobs and opportunities and so it just sets you up for success if you have one script then it's like uh it limits the number of opportunities you may and have. also reps you know, have a certain amount of capacity for building what they call baby writers, right? So you want to be able to get reps when you are ready, but also where you can kind of capitalize on opportunities so you can be working so they can get paid. You know what I mean? So it's one thing you have one great script and then that's it. And then they have nothing to work with in order to, like my, I think my job as a writer is to always give my reps something to do. Yes. Like, I, I think a lot of times as writers, we expect reps to do, yeah, there is an argument to be made, but like, I think my job is to always make sure they have something to do. So you're not of the mindset that, oh, you should have everything in one genre. I think the business is ever evolving. There are about 5 billion shows right now. <laughs> and again, I write comedy and drama. So for me, I think that if you're good, you're good. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like people are gonna be like, this is a good comedy script, this is a good drama, drama script. script yeah. And they will yeah. I do think that at the beginning though, it's important to kind of be uh, be clear about what you want to do and you can establish yourself in one space, right? Yeah. It's easier to say like, hey, I because at the time that I switched to, to writing on comedy, I'd written on three seasons of a drama, of different dramas. So I established myself clearly, I'm a drama writer, but hey, I could do a dramedy. And that allowed me to transition. I think people, reps at the beginning, I also don't believe, yeah, it's a business and reps and executives at the beginning, they like to put you in a box because it makes it easier for you to sell and market you. Um, but you could always know like, hey, I do both. And 
you may be lucky to have a rep who gets it and is down for it. But a lot of times, but sometimes down the road, like you might want to choose a lane and then down the road be like, I can do all this I can other do stuff. Like when I was NBC writers on the verge, I was a comedy writer, but I really wrote dramedy. And um, one of the things that the, the head of the program told me to do was some of the best advice. She told me to write a drama pilot, which was essentially a dramedy pilot. So now I say I'm half hour, an hour long. I write dramedy in a half hour, an hour long space. And that pilot that I wrote is what got me stopped on Sugar. Awesome. Okay. Oh, yes. Right here. Hi. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, Caribbean yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I write stories about Caribbean people set in the Caribbean. Um, do you feel like there's space for that in the global market? Because I don't see that represented much. Or do you write things like that as well? I'm talking about Caribbean people set in the Caribbean, not Caribbean people in a different country or, you know? I'm gonna be honest with you, I think that is harder. Yeah. Um, right. Only because we're just not, people don't know, we're like Trinidad and Tobago, what is that? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. People don't really understand our perspective and our, our experience, but I don't think that that should be dissuade you from, you know, right. if it's good, it's good, right? And I think if it's something that you are passionate about and you know and you understand, then like, I think for sure, um, yeah. pursue it. But I will say that in terms of like, people being able to market that, it may not happen at the same pace that if you were writing a story about Caribbeans in New York, Caribbean right. folks in yeah. Miami, you know? Yeah. So I say proceed with, proceed and do, you know, what feels good for you, but also just know that um, it does create a barrier of entry, which is unfair. Um, but a lot of times people need context that they can relate to in order to I've been to be trying to, to find like that balance, you know, yeah. like so that I, they can relate, you know, and that kind yeah, of Yeah, I think and I think that there may be opportunity streaming because streaming is global, right? Yeah. Yeah. So between yeah. Yeah. Netflix in particular really has an eye on the global market. So right. finding an entity like you know, I think your traditional US broadcasts, no. no. Right. That's very middle middle America. Cable, probably not, but I think that streaming with an eye because they have an eye towards being global and trying to, their business model is different, that could that could be an opportunity for you. And also, my dad, long story, but my dad has this treatment for this movie that's set in the Caribbean that we want to do. And what I started thinking about was like, oh, well, the Caribbean of Great Britain, that is a clear relationship. And so yeah. there are a lot of British like production companies yeah. and or like the government who could fund something like that. So you could think about it in that way too. Like it doesn't have to be through America. Like it yeah. could be the UK that could come on and do like a co-pro about a film like set in Trinidad, you know? Um, you should watch Yard. Did you watch Yardy? You just no. Elvis film? No. It was set in Jamaica and the UK. Oh yeah, yeah, I see yeah. that. I actually know Yeah, so that's an example that. of what you guys yeah. try. And then Nollywood is also doing really well on Netflix, like Ameri a lot of Americans. And I mean, well, I have one of my scripts was produced and we got produced and it's theatrically released throughout the Caribbean and wow. it's available on platforms. That's awesome. Great. It's called The Cutlass, but it just never got that kind of, you know, pull from a wider audience. So I feel like the, my writing is slightly shifting a bit more to kind of make people feel more like they can identify, um, just to, you know, slowly and, draw that. And in, there's kind of, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's what I was gonna say. Sometimes <laughs> we don't need a huge, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can also pivot, right? You make yeah. the one that's a little bit more friendly to the dias, or the whole diaspora, yes. and yeah. then pivot to the Trinidad I, only. Right. I was just telling a lot of people have never got shit made. Let's talk about that. No, yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> not <laughs> but we were, I was just telling, we were just talking about this at lunch, actually. Like sometimes you have to do something else to get what you actually want yeah. done. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes you have to be yeah. like, you know what? They're not ready for the. And it's the same thing with um with Whiplash, right? Mm -hmm. Um, actually for La La Land. Right, Damien Chazelle, right, he wrote Whiplash so he could get La 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 Man. Well, Ava wrote Middle of Nowhere before she wrote I Will Follow. She yeah. said I Will Follow first. Cause yeah, because mm. he knew La La Land, he had the script already, but he knew that people weren't gonna let him do it, so he did Whiplash first. Right. And I think sometimes you have to be strategic, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Like Sometimes you have to build a little, you know, power and clout in order to like, but I also think there's, like, if you made a film about Caribbean people for Caribbean people and Caribbean people saw it, that is a triumph. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we got. We don't have much time left, so I just right here. Yeah. yeah uh, Make the questions quick. Yeah. Guys. Can you say more about writing in your head? Um. Yeah. For me, I sketch. I'm not a Felicia is so good at this. Like she writes an outline, and she knows <laughs> she knows what's happening and what people are doing. 
I don't. Mm -hmm. I generally start with an idea and then I kind of jot things down and I'll be traveling somewhere or I'm at the beach or I'm in New Orleans and I'll start thinking about like, oh, this would be an interesting yeah. thing. I also get a lot of ideas by watching other things yeah. and it's never direct. It's never like this person got shot. So in my thing, somebody's getting shot. It's usually like I'm watching something like, oh, this helps me to think about a scene in a new way. Mm -hmm. So I'm always thinking about my work and I'm thinking about characters and scenarios and situations, but I'm not always actually writing it. Mm -hmm. And I think as a writer, irrespective of whether or not you are a disciplined writer or not, you should always kind of be active in your life and present and thinking and, and really absorbing all the things you're experiencing because that's what's gonna make your work better anyway. At what point in your writing do you start thinking about the music? Oh, I love, well, I write to music. I write music in my stuff. Music I probably will never be able to afford. Um, but I think sometimes also music, when you're writing it on the page, helps to provide context and also pacing. Um, so I think about it, but then I also realize that, again, I may never be able to afford this stuff. I may not even be, depending on what the project is, if I'm a writer on a feature, for example, I may not even be a part of the decision about the music, but I still put it in, uh, but I still put it in there. Um, a new thing that's happening a lot, well, I do a playlist for different scripts. So I do a Spotify playlist. Um, especially for features, I think it's really helpful. Yeah. Another thing I've been doing too is integrating those playlists into actual pitches. So like my the last deck I did for a feature project that I took out, we did a playlist and we embedded it in the, the PDF um, to help sell the film. Because it was a music-based film, but it was helpful to like kind of set the mood and give people a sense of what this project is. So I think especially if something is very music heavy or you know influenced, I think it's really helpful. Um, as far as the portfolio, when you want to give that to someone, does it have to be a complete portfolio, meaning like, does all the scripts need to be completed? Oh, when we say portfolio, we don't necessarily mean that like you're giving them some sort of like tangible thing. It's just what's in your repertoire of writing. Oh. So basically what we're meaning is like, <laughs> you know, really if you're complete. up for a job <laughs> about a, a family drama, you have a family drama script in your portfolio that you would send, is what we mean. It's not like a, a tangible thing that you have. It's just like the samples that you have, the sam writing samples that you have that you could send out on a project by project basis. Yeah. So like you would send like a, a excerpt from like 10, 15 pages? No, no, you send the whole script, but okay. you wouldn't necessarily send the whole portfolio. You wouldn't oh, send okay. all five it, scripts. Got it, got it. So maybe you got like two strong scripts, but you say I'm working on these three other things. No, you want all of them. You oh, want to have as many, you want to have as many strong scripts finished as possible, right? Because you want to be able to be like, if they got a, a show about, you know, black vampires set in the 80s, you're like, oh, I got that. You know what I mean? You want to be there in an ideal world, but you want to have as many strong scripts as possible because that gives you more opportunities that you can go after because what you want typically is to send stuff that would be tonally like the show you're going up for or the opportunity that you're going up for so for example the reason why I had to send my not my YA novel is because it's a gritty Baltimore novel I didn't have any gritty one-hour pilots for yeah. this feature that I'm up for. So I had to send my novel. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and you wouldn't want to send more than one script unless they ask for it. This is what this is what to me strategically what you do. Hey, can you introduce me to your agent? You have one vetted script that has been noted to death and you've rewritten it to death. You send that script. You also have prepared in your queue if they're like, does she have something else? You have your second best script, mm -hmm. you know? And then when you meet with that agent and they're like, okay, we're trying to create a career for you, <laughs> you can say, I also have these two other scripts that you should take a look at. Like, just so you're ready to kind of hit the ground running. Got it. Um, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> can you please break down the selling process? We have one minute. <laughs> Selling like, like TV or film. So you mentioned that you sold a couple of scripts, right? So on TV, uh, I was doing both. And if it's a good Yeah, yeah. Um, I sold them both on pitches. 
So it started out as going into the production company and pitching the project. Well, of course, developing the pitch. I did a lovely pitch workshop yesterday, if you were. And there you go. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, no, it starts out by developing the pitch, and you go in. Typically, you start at the production company level because you want to partner with a production company that you can then go into a studio and or a network with. So typically, the production company level, you may that you may be uh, pitching a number of production companies in order to see who might be the best partner for your project. Um, and then once you have a production company on board, you typically work with that production company to refine the pitch. They may have notes, and that's when you take it to the studio level. This is for TV. Um, and when you go to the studio level, the production company comes in with you, and you pitch the studio. And then the goal, hopefully, is then to get the studio attached. And that point, you do a deal. It's called an income deal, where they're basically like, if you sell it, we're going to pay you. And then you go into the network, and you hopefully are able to sell it to the network. And then after that, though, that doesn't necessarily mean that the show is going to be on the air. You have to, if especially if it's off a pitch, you then write the script. And then everybody has to kind of be on board, those three entities, that this is the same show we all want to make. That's a lot. Um, and, and then the network then has to decide um, whether or not they want to move forward, which is a, a many of reasons why they might make that decision, right? That it fits in their programming, this is the show that they actually want to do. And moving forward may mean a pilot commitment, they'll shoot your pilot. Usually on the Netflix level, it means they order a series because they don't shoot pilots. Um, it may even mean on the network, traditional network level that they order a series. So it can mean different things, but it's a lot of steps. And that's what we call development hell, where your project is going through all this. And it typically changes from your initial intention, because there's so many cooks in the kitchen, to what actually might make it on air. And I think they said, like, do traditional development season, which is broadcast really through July through December. It's like 500 pitches. Um, they buy, like, I don't know, they said, like a hundred or something, and then forty are made pilots, and then five go on air. Wow. That's yeah. like a. How long does this development help? How long does that last? Oh Lord Forever. Jesus! <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm still. I I sold my TV show last year, and we're just finally getting to sit. And did you pick? Are you picking the pilot? Um, you gotta yes. wrap up. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, if you guys want to continue the conversation, you can definitely do it in that um, hallway out there. Thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you, Alicia and Roche. You. you guys are amazing. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, see you soon.